fills the cockpit. Go around, go for it. It's the low altitude warning. To the pilots, it seems impossible. They don't even have the runway in sight yet. Go around! Go around thrust. The captain decides to abort the landing. But it may be too late. The crew of British Midland Flight 92 is completing final takeoff preparations for a short flight to Belfast, Northern Ireland. Captain Kevin Hunt flew the plane in from Belfast. First Officer David McClellan takes the controls for the return trip. Thrust set. Here we go. As Flight 92 clears the busy airspace around Heathrow, the controller permits the crew to climb to the cruising altitude, 35,000 feet. Can I have a coffee too, please? 13 minutes into the flight. Oh. You smell that? Is that smoke? There's a problem with one of the 737's two engines. Captain Hunt takes control, leaving his first officer to work out what's wrong with the plane. It's a fire, Kevin. Which one is it? It's the right one. The crew tries to stabilize the problem engine by reducing power on that side. OK, throttle it back. Throttle it back. Seems to be running all right now. The crew seems to have solved the immediate crisis. But we still got the smoke. But want to get back on the ground as fast as possible. Uh, this is Midland 92. Uh, we've got an engine fire. We need to divert to East Midland. Understood. Cleared for descent to 10,000 feet. Flight 92 is just 15 minutes from East Midlands Airport. It's closer than returning to Heathrow. Landing lights. On. The pilots will have to make the landing with just one engine. Flaps one, please. To land safely at low speed. Flaps one. The pilots need to set their flaps to increase lift. Power, please. And call for more power from their one remaining engine. Pilots face a terrifying new danger. We're losing another engine. Incredibly, the left engine is now failing. Their plane could soon have no engine power at all. Flight 92 is less than a thousand feet from the ground. The pilots need to think fast. Try relighting the other one. They try to restart the engine they shut down. It's not, I, I, I can't see to. It won't start. One engine is dead. The other is in flames. I have to stretch the glide. Captain Hunt pulls up the nose of the plane, hoping to stay in the air long enough to reach the airport. But more and more alarms are filling the cockpit. Damn it! The stall warning shakes the captain's controls. A deadly sign that they're about to lose their lift. British Midland Flight 92 has slammed into an embankment beside the M1 highway, just half a mile from the airport. 87 of the 126 people on board are alive, but many are injured, including Captain Hunt, who has a broken spine. Chris Pollard scrutinizes engine debris recovered from farmland near Kegworth. Every fragment is a potential clue about what happened to British Midland Flight 92. Some bits were extremely small. It, it is actually a tribute to the quality of the search that we got as much as we did. One fragment stands out. Gotcha. It shows clear signs of metal fatigue. Because of where it was found, 
Pollard believes it was almost certainly the first thing to break on the 737. If we assume that the fatigue failure was the first failure, that would have lost about four inches off the end of one of the blades. The finding could explain how the engine failure began. Even one broken fan blade can disturb the flow of air through an engine, causing it to surge, a process similar to a car backfiring. What is it, the engines? The engine tries to find a new balance, and to do that, it rattles around. It'll be all right, man. It would have been a lot of physical vibration. The passengers reported that it was like the sound of, um, in a tumble dryer, of rocks and stuff being thrown around. It would have really been quite violent. No two fan blades are ever exactly the same. Pollard hopes a metallurgical examination will tell him which engine the weakened blade came from. Although the blades were all nominally of exactly the same alloy, there were, if you started to look in the sort of parts per million analysis of these things, there were slight differences between each blade. Pollard soon has an answer. Blade 17, left engine. The blade that broke first and caused the vibration came from the left engine. Investigators now face a troubling question. Why did the pilot shut down the right engine if the vibrations were in the left? A crew this experienced? It's hard to believe they would shut down the wrong engine. Pilots have an array of instruments that tell them about the operation of their engines, including one that measures vibration. There's another possibility. The vibration may have been so severe that it became impossible to read the shuddering gauges. Right, here are gauges. The layout of the cockpit instruments may provide a partial explanation. Right engine. Right. Oh. See, I can see how you'd mess this up. The gauges that measure vibration sit on the right side of the panel. Under stress, the first officer may have thought they correspond to the right engine. The problem is definitely in the right engine. But the theory doesn't hold up. If the crew shut down the good right engine, why did the vibration suddenly stop in the faulty left engine? They reduced the power on the right engine, but somehow the left engine settles down. An important piece is missing from this puzzle. You need a little bit of auto trim to the left, huh? What's that? You need a little bit of auto trim to the left. Okay. Captain Thomas Welch and First Officer Josef Turner are flying a Boeing 767 from Bangkok, Thailand to Vienna, Austria. The flight is operated by Lauda Air, the brainchild of famed Austrian Formula One driver, Niki Lauda. For me, it was a logical step after retiring from racing uh, to start in this kind of business. And that's what I did with Lauda Air. Throughout the 70s, Lauda dominated Formula One racing. Niki was the best driver in his days. Still in the I think Nicky is the best known Austrian uh, since Mozart. And that's how they finish. Nicky Lauda takes the flag. He won the world championship three times. Then used his fame to launch a new career and a new airline. One of the main reasons was to give the passengers a different way of flying. Better service, better food. The airplane had to look in a, in a certain way. The Lauda Air 767 is less than 15 minutes into its 11-hour flight to Vienna. It's a route Niki Lauda knows firsthand, because he's not just the owner of the airline, he's also one of its pilots. When you run a company and you fly, it's very simple. Because when you are with your passengers, then you know what is going on. You can look yourself what the problems are, and I corrected things quicker in that way. Capture 13, 
reserve is 20. In the cockpit, Captain Welch and First Officer Turner monitor their instruments while the autopilot controls the climb. Suddenly, the plane begins dropping from the sky. Christ! Pilots have lost control. Loud of Flight 4 is plummeting to Earth. The plane slams into a remote jungle 110 miles northwest of Bangkok. When rescuers arrive, it's immediately obvious that there's no one to be rescued. All 213 passengers and 10 crew members are dead. The airplane took off at 1601 UTC. Uh, there was no fault or whatever reported from the pilots. The airplane flew about uh, 20 to 25 minutes and then suddenly disappeared off the radar screen. So we have no indication whatsoever, whatsoever happened to the airplane. Investigators in Thailand have made a surprising find. The thrust reverser on Flight 4's left engine is fully deployed. Once we actually saw that the thrust reverser had deployed, for me, it was, it was shocking. It was not anything I really expected would happen. Thrust reversers help jetliners come to a stop on landing. They work by redirecting engine thrust forward to slow the plane down. Left side deployed in midair. No doubt. Planes have built-in safeguards to prevent reversers from deploying during flight. But even if it does happen, it shouldn't cause a crash. In fact, flight testing has already shown exactly that. Before the 767 first went into service, Boeing had to prove that pilots could keep flying safely after a mid-air deployment. There was a lot of vibration, a lot of noise, but the airplane was controllable. The pilots only experienced a small loss of lift. As a result, Boeing certified the 767 as capable of continued safe flight and landing under any possible position of the thrust reverser. But the discovery of an engine with a deployed reverser is so unusual, investigators must conclude that it's somehow related to the crash. How does a thrust reverser bring down a 767? We're missing something. If it turns out that a faulty thrust reverser can bring down a plane, it has ominous implications for the entire airline industry. The lives of hundreds of thousands of passengers around the world could be in jeopardy. We recognized that we had something that was uh, very unusual and would, uh, would require a lot of analysis. The deployed thrust reverser is the strongest lead investigators have. But no one can figure out how it could have caused the crash. Investigators will have to solve the mystery without their most valuable tool. The flight data recorder is so badly burned that technicians at the NTSB can't recover any data. But there's better news about the cockpit voice recorder. It has survived the fire. Ready to go. The voice recorder shows a normal takeoff and climb. Lending gears up. All this kind of normal communication, which I knew all the people. <clears throat> so for me, it was honestly hard. This was the hardest part of all my life. We are clear to level 310 and maintaining louder 4. Flight 4 climbs to 7,000 feet without a problem. 
A little more than five and a half minutes into the flight, the first hint of trouble. Chase it. And that keeps, uh... It's come on. What's come on? Some kind of warning. The pilots have noticed an alert that's coming on in the cockpit. Could this be the clue that unlocks the mystery of Lava Flight 4? Brazil in the late 1980s is a country in transition. Today, millions of soccer man Brazilians tune in as their beloved team takes on arch rival Chile. The critical match in Rio is all anyone is talking about, even a thousand miles away at Maraba Airport, where the crew of Varig Flight 254 is getting ready for takeoff. Varig Flight 254 is scheduled to fly north from the mining town of Maraba to Belém, near the mouth of the Amazon River. Captain Cesar Garza is flying the plane tonight, while First Officer Nielsen Zile monitors the instruments. V1, rotate. At 5.35 p.m., the Boeing 737 gets airborne. After 23 minutes, the flight computer tells the captain that they're getting close to Belém. The pilots try to contact controllers on the ground. Belém Tower, Vari 254, requesting descent. Strangely, they get no response from the tower. Belém Tower, Vari 254. Belém Tower, do you read? That's funny. What? We're not picking up the beacon either. Airports are equipped with very high-frequency omnidirectional range beacons, or VOR beacons. They send out signals that planes follow to the runway. Why don't we see if we can pick up a local radio station from Berlin? The captain tries to home in on a local radio signal, hoping it will help guide them toward the city. The do-or-die soccer game is being broadcast by radio stations all across the country. The pilots have managed to pick up a local station broadcasting the match, the captain is confident he's now on course. He's spotted a landmark on his radar. There we go. We're over the Amazon now. Belém is near the mouth of the Amazon. Following the river should lead the pilots to the city. But moments later, there's serious trouble. At 8.45 p.m., Flight 254 runs out of fuel. The left engine is the first to die. We just lost an engine! Hang on. I'm going to put her down. But there goes the other one! The inevitable impact is just seconds away. Just need to bring us down. Nice and slow. Of the 54 passengers and crew, 48 have survived. We have to get you out of here, okay? Can you hear me? <sighs> Surviving the crash landing feels like a miracle to many of the passengers, but they now face a new threat to their survival. They're stranded in the vast Amazon rainforest with no food, no water, and no guarantee that they'll ever be found. No. Investigators look into the possibility that the navigation system on Varig Flight 254 malfunctioned and led the crew off course. They suspect the plane's cargo may hold the key. The 737 has a magnetic sensor in the tail that acts as the plane's compass. It tracks which direction the plane is flying and feeds that information to the cockpit instruments. If something in Flight 254's cargo was giving off a strong magnetic field, it might have confused the sensor. They also test every component of the navigation system and check for any sign of failure. 
but they find nothing in the cargo that could affect the compass. And the instruments are working perfectly. Investigators catch a break. Flight 254's flight plan has been recovered from the cockpit. Airlines provide flight plans to every crew. It contains critical details about the route they should fly, including the heading they're meant to take. Oh, thanks. Well, let's see what this will tell us. But what if the airlines gave the pilots a faulty flight plan, one that sent them in the wrong direction? This could be the lead they've been waiting for. I think I know what they did wrong. A close look at Varig 254's flight plan provides a revelation. In this particular case with the Varig flight, very unusually, their computer flight plan system has four digits. This is very, very unusual, as they almost always uh, have only three. The number 0270 was intended to mean 27.0 degrees. He was supposed to fly north, heading 027. The captain read it as 270 degrees, or due west. So instead of flying northeast... They went west instead, going 270. He entered the wrong heading. He set the airplane up to depart west. 270 degrees, or due west on the compass, is more than 240 degrees past the northerly heading of 27 degrees they were given. The moment of truth arrives when they call Captain Garces back in to give his side of the story. At first, the captain is reluctant to admit he made a mistake. Under intense questioning, Garces finally admits he misread the flight plan. Look, it was an honest mistake. Investigators learn the airline began printing their flight plans this new way while the captain was on vacation. It's easy to see how you get confused. But there's another question. The first officer must also enter the heading from the flight plan. So, yes, so, mm. you think Julia has a chance tonight? <laughs> Why did he make exactly the same mistake as the captain? He could have caught this mistake before they took off. Varig 254 takes off due west instead of north, straight into the setting sun. Get up. It's an incomprehensible error. Did they not realize they were flying into the sun? That should have been a big cue. They must have been very confident that they had done the right thing. Tucumán International Airport in Panama City. P1. Copa Airlines Flight 201 takes off for a short flight to Cali, Colombia. Rotate. Captain Rafael Chial is Copa's most senior pilot. Today, he's monitoring the instruments. Set thrust to climb. First Officer Cesario Tejada is flying the plane. Forty passengers are on board, mostly business travelers heading home to Colombia. The flight usually takes about an hour. But tonight, there's a hitch that could add some time. We've got some heavy weather moving in from the Gulf. Flight 201 is heading straight for a storm. It looks clear to the east. The pilots need to find a way to fly around the bad weather. Agreed. I will let them know what we are doing. Panama Center, Copa 201. We'd like to get around this weather, requesting a new heading for 090. Copa 201, copy that. You're cleared on a heading 090. Cleared, heading 090. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a uh, short detour to avoid some bumpy weather. It may delay our arrival in Cali. I will keep you posted. The new flight path will take the 737 east around the storm before heading south again to Cali. Uh, 
Panama Center, Copa 201. It's been 12 minutes since takeoff. Level at 250. The captain tells controllers he's reached cruising altitude at 25,000 feet. Minutes later, the plane disappears from radar. The controller tries the radio, but gets no response. Graciela Ocana is one of the controllers on duty. The flight was leaving Panama airspace, entering Colombia airspace. Hopefully it's just interference from the storm. The plane's last known location was over Panama's remote Darien Gap. Their last radar return was here, over the Darien jungle. The plane has vanished over an almost impenetrable jungle. If Copa 201 crashed here, just getting to the crash site will be a huge struggle. Okana reports the missing flight to aviation authorities. Hey, have you had any radio contact with Copa 201? Then comes the news she's been dreading. Early in the morning, I received a call from a radio station in Dadien. Any survivors? Witnesses on the ground have reported a terrifying sight. During the night, they saw a big ball of fire falling from the sky. We had to find out where the aircraft was and if there was anyone alive they could save. The next day, searchers make their way to the crash site but all 47 of the people on board are dead. Investigators need to know if a faulty cockpit instrument was giving the crew of Flight 201 misleading data about the position of their plane. They test the displays and the gyros that feed them. Well, this one seems to work fine. They find nothing wrong with the first officer's instrument. Let's see the other one and they run the same test on the captain's attitude indicator. At first, the captain's instrument seems fine too. Then, they notice something odd. Hang on, it seems to be stuck. Occasionally, the display momentarily freezes in place. The attitude indicator stops moving, even though the gyro feeding it is still in motion. Investigators need to know what's causing the failure. They test every wire connecting the display to the gyro. Oh. No wonder. Finally, they find the culprit. This wire is hanging by a thread. The discovery gives new meaning to the bizarre rolling motion captured by the flight data recorder. The captain's instrument and the flight recorder are both fed by the same gyro. Since the captain's gyro was broken, it was sending faulty roll data to the recorder. Copa 201 didn't really make any quick rolling maneuvers at all. Okay, let's see what the plane was really doing. By carefully analyzing other parameters on the flight data recorder, they managed to calculate its actual movements and reveal the plane's true motion. The red image shows the bad data the pilots were seeing while the solid image shows how Copa 201 was actually flying. The plane rolls so far to the right, it becomes unrecoverable. Though the pilots don't know it, they're now falling from the sky. Once I got to this point, they didn't have a chance. But a puzzling question remains. It was the captain's gyro that failed in flight and started sending bad data. So why did the pilots select it? Okay, let's start. Investigators go into the type of flight simulator the Copa crew used for their 737 training. Climb to 25,000 and turn right. They recreate the flight of Copa 201. Now, trigger the failure. Including the malfunction of the captain's attitude indicator. Now, how'd you make the switch? Wait a minute, let me see that. That is not the same switch that was on Copa 201. Two different configurations for one small control switch 
has overwhelming implications for the investigation. In the simulator, flipping the toggle to the left switches the captain's instrument to an auxiliary gyro, independent of the other two. On flight 201, flipping the switch to the left puts both instruments on the captain's malfunctioning gyro. Panama Center, Copa 201, uh, level at 250. Roger that, 201. With no voice recording from the cockpit of Copa 201, investigators will never know for certain who flipped the switch the wrong way. But they finally collected enough evidence to build a compelling theory of how the flight went so horribly wrong. One cargo 37, runway 34 left, clear to land. The MD-11 is still a popular workhorse for flying cargo. FedEx relies on the plane to haul millions of tons of freight in and out of crucial hubs like Tokyo's Narita Airport, one of the busiest airports in the world. Narita Tower, FedEx 80, 13 miles for 34 left. 54-year-old Kevin Mosley is the captain on FedEx Flight 80. His first officer is 49-year-old Anthony Pino. The two veteran pilots are second in line to land at Narita. FedEx 80, Narita Tower on runway 34 left, continue approach. FedEx 80, roger. Seven minutes from landing, the controller gives the crew an update about the wind conditions on the runway. Okay, copy that. The pilots are in the midst of their approach, a crucial time in any flight. The crew must perform dozens of steps to lose altitude and drop about 400 miles an hour of airspeed before they touch down. It's a very busy time in the cockpit. On this flight, the pilots have an additional challenge to contend with, powerful winds. Any thoughts on landing speed? Let's add 10 knots, make it 164 knots. They need to come in faster than usual to combat the gusty conditions. Landing gear. Gear down. Four green. Five hundred. <laughs> we uh <laughs> cleared to land, thirty-four left. Stable. <laughs> the plane is dropping thirteen feet per second. It will be on the ground in less than five seconds. Without warning, the MD-11 is upside down in flames. There's a crash on 34 left and there's fire. Fire crews race to the runway where a massive blaze has engulfed the cockpit of FedEx Flight 80. It's the biggest air disaster the Tokyo airport has ever seen. Air traffic controllers must now redirect incoming flights away from the burning debris. It takes almost half an hour for firefighters to douse the flames surrounding the cockpit. By the time rescuers get inside, it's too late for the pilots. Two people are dead and another MD-11 lies burning at the side of a runway. This is the first fatal accident in Narita Airport's 31-year history. The aviation world needs to know why this MD-11 landing went so wrong. Flight 80's cockpit recording is now in the hands of investigators. But will it tell them why the pilots couldn't get their planes safely on the ground? Narita Tower, FedEx 80, 13 miles for 34 left. FedEx 80, Narita Tower on runway 34 left, continue approach. FedEx 80, roger. All right, let's begin the before landing checklist. Got it. So far, so good. The approach to Narita is textbook. Landing gear. Gear down. Winds are 320, maximum at 34 knots. Okay, stop for a second. 
wins. 320, maximum 34. It's right in their face. The recording reveals the crew was flying into a strong headwind, but it wasn't dangerous enough to explain the crash. Okay, let's go on. 1,000. Yeehaw! Ride him, cowboy. <laughs> Don't let the airplane fly you. You fly the airplane. And on a gusty, blustery day, that's in fact what you have to do. 500. Despite the bumpy ride, the pilots don't seem very concerned. Clear to land, 34 left. Stable. <laughs> Stable approach is one of the call outs that more and more carriers have put into their operation specifications that you call out because generally that's a pretty well understood thing. If you're stable, you can land. <laughs> One minute from the runway, and they're joking. Seems like there's nothing wrong. From the recording, we can tell that they were really relaxed and teasing each other. I think what happened was that the air currents were so rough that it felt like they were in a rodeo, riding an untamed horse like cowboys. Then, an automated voice from the altimeter gives investigators an important clue. That last part again, please. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. It should slow down. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. The recording tells investigators the plane's descent didn't slow down when it should have, but instead continued dropping at a rapid rate. It explains the hard landing, but not the crash. Another critical question remains. Why didn't the pilots slow their descent? Till they can answer that question, investigators won't know the full story behind the crash of FedEx Flight 80. Kennedy makes a final pre-flight check of his new plane, a Piper Saratoga. It's uh, top of the line, single engine, six seater. It was well equipped with a GPS, a global positioning system. The selling point for the Saratoga was it has four club seats facing each other in the rear of the aircraft. Seatbelts on, please. There are some headsets back there if you want to listen in. <laughs> All right. Uh... Battery on, fuel pump on, and propeller is uh, clear. The flight to Martha's Vineyard should take about 90 minutes. After that, it's just a short hop to Hyannisport. The route from Essex County Airport to Martha's Vineyard, he was uh, quite familiar, he'd done it several times. At 8.40 p.m., more than two hours behind schedule, the flight gets underway. 75 knots. Oh, yeah. Like many private pilots, Kennedy is flying under visual flight rules, or VFR. You stay clear of clouds, you have to have good visibility. You're always looking outside, able to see the horizon and orient the airplane using your visual cues. And that's the best view in New York you're ever going to get. Once you turn towards the east, you had a nice view of Manhattan, the Hudson River. On a good day, you could see, oh, 30 miles or so at altitude. Kennedy cruises at just 5,500 feet, a typical altitude for small planes. Around 9.30 p.m., he leaves the mainland coast behind. Just leave him on talk over there. I don't see a thing. He 
his flight path was following the coast. So he would want to go south over the Long Island Sound to line up and set up for a long straight end for the runway. He expects to reach their first destination in about half an hour. We'll have you on the ground by 10 for sure. But by 10 o'clock. Martha's Vineyard Tower. Airport security here. The air traffic controller at Martha's Vineyard Airport has had no contact with the Kennedy plane. Any word on that flight? Uh, negative. I haven't been notified of that arrival. Overdue flights are not uncommon. But as the hours pass with no sign of the Piper Saratoga, a chilling reality sets in. John F. Kennedy, his wife and sister-in-law, are missing without a trace. Investigators zero in on a theory that may explain the fatal accident that killed John F. Kennedy Jr., his wife Carolyn, and her sister Lauren. At the center of it all, a pilot in over his head, battling a mounting list of pressures. No, you shouldn't worry. No, we've got it. I'm having problems at work. I need to get to this wedding. My ankle hurts. I get in the airplane, that's why I bought this airplane. I need to get from point A to point B. That's the whole point of having this airplane and learning to fly, so we're gonna go. I think I know why things started to go wrong. One, two, seven, point two, five. A badly tuned radio and a hazy night allow investigators to imagine a scenario that may explain the flight's tragic end. It started after he cleared New York. In hazy conditions, Kennedy would have no visual reference to tell him which way is up. As it was getting dark in marginal conditions, he was in a very precarious area for visual flight roll of VFR flying. As he headed out over the water and all those lights were behind him, all that visual reference was gone. He looks away from his instruments for like a second. One, two, seven, point two, five. Remember, his frequency was off. Maybe he was trying to tune the radio. He might look to see if the frequency had changed or if he had got it wrong in his mind. Still nothing. Just something weird with the radio. No big deal. While all that's going on, it's quite easy for the airplane to slip into a little bit of a bank, one direction or another. If you're in a turn for an extended period of time, your inner ear can feel a reverse of the turn, and you can get, become spatially disoriented very easily. What the? What? It can't be. He looks back, his instruments are telling him one thing, his sense is another. What the? You have to be well trained to disregard what your brain is saying and look at your instruments, work on your scan, and fly by your instruments. Once he becomes disoriented, Kennedy is too inexperienced to force himself to believe his instruments, no matter what his senses are telling him. Nothing's working. So it's the only thing that fits. Spatial disorientation. takeoff speed is 228 miles per hour, 46 miles faster than a 747. Four greens. The plane's four afterburners ignite 
giving the engines the boost they need to achieve that incredible speed. As it passes you, you feel it and you hear it because it is loud and strong and it, uh, it's just a, a, a beautiful sight to uh, the spectator and the aviator. V1. The first officer tells the captain they've reached V1, or decision speed. They're now going too quickly to abort the takeoff. You cannot stop anymore. You have to go on. You have to continue takeoff, whatever happens. Watch out! Suddenly, the plane begins veering left. Stop! The flight engineer urges the captain to abort the takeoff, but it's too late to stop. Captain Marty lifts the supersonic jet into the air. Gilles Langelin realizes he's now watching a disaster. It was a very unexpected uh, situation to see frames on an aircraft that is departing on a runway. You don't have time to lose, so immediately I've pushed the, the red button, which is a button for alert. Four five nine zero, you have flames behind you. Roger. The plane is engulfed in flames. Failure. Engine two. Engine fire procedure. Captain Marty struggles for control as the engineer shuts down the burning engine and activates a fire extinguisher. What's the airspeed? The plane's airspeed is now dangerously low. The airspeed, the airspeed. Something is happening. Some things that is not covered by training. Something that uh, in pilot career you don't want to face. Longelin scrambles to clear other planes from Concorde's path. I wanted to clear the traffic to so let him any option possible. First Officer Marco wants to head for a nearby airport. La Bourget. La Bourget. But the crew can't outfly the fire that is rapidly consuming their plane. Shocking images of the unfolding disaster are captured by amateur video. In the cabin, panic and terror. No time. The supersonic marvel of modern aviation. No. Slams into an airport hotel. Oh, mon dieu. I could see a kind of big girl. Uh like a big mushroom of smoke. I think until the very last moments, we, I was thinking that something will save the situation. I remember that I just sat down on the, on the carpet floor of the control tower up there and I cried. How much fuel have we used? Flight engineer Gilles Jardineau keeps a vigilant eye on fuel consumption. We've got 800 kilos. Concorde burns through it at an astonishing rate. In the short taxi to the runway, the plane's four engines have already used as much fuel as the average car uses in six months. Booking a seat on the famed jet requires deep pockets. The return fare to New York costs more than $9,000. It was not something unaffordable for those people we had on board. Some of them, I tell you, they, they didn't even know how much they were paying. Air France 4590, runway 26 right, clear for takeoff. 4590, cleared for takeoff, 26 right. The tower controller today is Gilles Langelin. I was stationed in the southern control tower, which has a very good view over the two runways that we use. This day was the same as usual. I gave him the takeoff clearance. Four greens. V1. The 
first officer tells the captain they've reached V1, or decision speed. They're now going too quickly to abort the takeoff. You cannot stop anymore. You have to go on. You have to continue takeoff, whatever happens. Watch out! Suddenly, the plane begins veering left. Stop! The flight engineer urges the captain to abort the takeoff, but it's too late to stop. Captain Marty lifts the supersonic jet into the air. Gilles Langelin realizes he's now watching a disaster. This was a very unexpected uh, situation to see frames on an aircraft that is departing on the runway. You don't have time to lose, so I immediately I've pushed the, the red button, which is the button for alert. 4590, you have flames behind you. Roger! The plane is engulfed in flames. Failure, engine two. Engine fire procedure. Captain Marty struggles for control as the engineer shuts down the burning engine and activates a fire extinguisher. What's the airspeed? The plane's airspeed is now dangerously low. The airspeed, the airspeed. Something is happening. Some things that is not covered by training. Something that uh, in pilot career you don't want to face. First Officer Marco wants to head for a nearby airport. La Bourget. La Bourget. But the crew can't outfly the fire that is rapidly consuming their plane. The supersonic marvel of modern aviation. No! Slams into an airport hotel. Oh, mon dieu. I could see kind of big, uh, like a big mushroom of smoke. I think until the very last moments, we, I was thinking that something will save the situation. November 4th, 2008. A Learjet 45 is cruising over central Mexico. Victor Mike Charlie, radar contact. Descend to 200. 200, Mike Charlie. Alvaro Sanchez and Martino Leva are at the controls. Both pilots are captains. But tonight, Captain Oliva is flying the plane. I'll start setting 250, Alvaro, okay? Sounds right to me. The flight is a special government charter. We must be getting close. The country's interior minister and his entourage are flying to Mexico City. The politicians are on their way back to the capital after a day of talks aimed at combating the nation's skyrocketing rate of violent crime. The Mexican government has chartered a Learjet 45 for the flight. It's a high-performance aircraft that's also economical to fly. Victor Mike Charlie, descend to 15,000 feet. Altimeter 3024. 15,000 with 3024, Mike Charlie. 1,000 feet until we level off. Thanks, Alvaro. As the Learjet nears the outskirts of Mexico City, the pilots prepare to land. Landing lights. Yep. Check. Victor Mike Charlie, reduce your speed to 180 knots. Reducing speed to 180, Mike Charlie. The air traffic controller asks the Learjet crew to slow down to maintain their position in the lineup of planes. Should I pull the nose up? No, leave it. Leave it for now. Tonight, Alvaro Sanchez is serving as something of a mentor. But we're about to level off, right? Yes. He's more experienced in the Learjet than Captain Oliva. There, speed stabilized. OK. This is one of the busiest and most critical stages of any flight. Flap down. Sanchez extends the flap so he can further reduce their speed. Give me 8800, please. 
8800. Below them, Mexico City is a sprawling metropolis of 20 million people with some of the worst traffic in the world. A sea of cars fills the downtown district. Oh my God! Without warning, the Learjet goes into a steep dive and plummets toward the ground. What do we do? Help it all! Give it to me! The first officer calls for control of the plane. It's yours, Alvaro. He holds his control column back, trying to pull the plane out of the dive. Hey. Ulrika Bjorkstam is in the street below, waiting for a cab. All of a sudden, I saw this plane flying, like, really low. I had the time to turn around, and I started running away from it. But of course, the plane was a little bit faster than what I was. I remember thinking that, well, this is it. This is it for me. We have a few minutes. Show me that report. Despite some damage from fire and impact forces, technicians have been able to recover the recorded data. We knew we didn't have FDR. We were glad to hear, though, that the CVR uh, did work and that the accident flight had been captured. All right, I think we waited long enough. Let's hear it. Victor Mike Charlie, reduce your speed to 180 knots. Reducing speed to 180, Mike Charlie. Because it's a small aircraft, we could hear not just all the sounds that were in the, in the cockpit, but we could also hear the, the sounds in the cabin. We must be getting close. As they listen to the moments just before the crash, they hear nothing out of the ordinary. Above the nozzle? No, leave it. Leave it for now. One of the things that it did reassure us is that there was not an intentional act that brought down the aircraft. There was no sound similar to a struggle. There was no sounds of an explosive device. And so that helped close the, the book on, on that aspect of the investigation. The mystery of what did cause the crash persists. Look down. Investigators listen as the pilots descend toward the runway. Look. Hmm. They're all lined up in front of us. All seems well until. Turbulence from that thing. Oh, man. One of the interesting things that we did hear was that the flight crew did mention uh, turbulence. What the hell? Uh, 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 uh. All right, sounds like that's where the trouble starts. Where are we at? 14 seconds before hitting the ground. It seems the Learjet hit a patch of violently unstable air. Oh, my god. All of a sudden, boom, they're upside down, plummeting towards the ground. Galvano! What do we do? Without the flight data, the voice recording leaves investigators with only a partial picture. We don't know exactly what each of these pilots was thinking at the time. We don't know what control inputs were being made. But it shows that there was that confusion factor in the cockpit of what to do, how to recover the aircraft from the upset. They don't seem to know what hit them. Alvaro, what do we do, Alvaro? Give it to me. You know, hearing that sound and, you know, putting myself in the, their place and knowing what that outcome is going to be, it's got to be horrible. It's yours, Alvaro! They tried to pull out. It wasn't enough. They had so little time. They had so little altitude. We had a normal flight coming in, and then we had a loss of control relatively quick. Uh, there was no evidence of any mechanical failure. So what do you think? Wake turbulence? So we had to really look at the possibility of a wake turbulence event. Wake turbulence forms when the low pressure air above the wing draws high pressure air upward creating a swirling vortex that trails behind the aircraft as it flies. 
As a plane flies along, each of its wingtips is generating a tiny horizontal tornado called a wingtip vortex. The power of a vortices can linger in the air for minutes at a time, creating an invisible hazard for other aircraft. When a smaller plane flies into these rotating columns of air at low altitude, they can spin out of control and crash into the ground within seconds. The commuter flight from Belfast, Northern Ireland, was supposed to land in Cork at 9 a.m. Maybe Kerry. 30 minutes later, it's still circling the airport. Cork faces out to the Atlantic, so fog is, is very common. Uh, and fog will roll in, and it will roll out, uh, sometimes at no notice. In our part of the world, we have a, a saying, it was like pea soup, because it was very, very thick. Hope we land soon. I've got work to do. There are 10 passengers waiting to land this morning, including Lawrence Wilson, traveling to Cork for the day on business. I was going to Cork to do forklift truck training. I had been in that same location, doing the same course uh, several times before. So it was sort of really old hat to go down. I've done it before. Today's flight is aboard a Fairchild Metro 3. Flying the plane today is First Officer Andrew Cantle of England. While he concentrates on circling over Cork, Spanish Captain Jordi Sola Lopez is checking the weather at nearby airports. Surface wind is calm. Visibility is 900 meters in fog. All copy, thanks very much. And uh, the weather, is it improving in Cork? At 9.35, the controller tells the captain the fog is lifted slightly. Visibility at touchdown zone is 500 meters. OK, in that case, any chance to perform one approach there? You are clear to land runway 17. Clear to land runway 17. After 30 minutes circling the airport, the crew must now shift focus to the complex task of getting their plane on the ground. We're good. I've landed and worse. Glide slope is coming in. The pilot confirms the plane is lining up with the runway. OK, glide slope is coming in and they're descending at the correct speed. Speed's OK. I took control of their power, OK? The captain tells the first officer he'll adjust the engine power during the landing. That's fine, yeah. All the lights are on. Landing gear is down. Yes, the weather is much better here. I was on the left-hand side of the plane, uh, looking out just behind the wing. And I remember I couldn't see anything, no runway, nothing at all. The captain pulls the thrust levers back to reduce power. Unexpectedly, the plane rolls hard to the left. What the heck? I remember looking out the window and seeing grass about 10 foot below me. And I knew that wasn't good. Thought I was gone. I did for a minute or two. I thought I was gone. I thought, this is it. I'm, I'm out of here. That's all about it. Black box data from Flight 7100 is finally in the hands of investigators. But will it give them the breakthrough they're hoping for? All copy, thanks very much. And the weather, is it uh, improving in Cork? The voice recorder has captured the pilot's conversation in the crucial moments before the crash. Speed's OK. Liddy listens as the pilots discuss their landing preparations. At this stage, everything seems normal. I took control of their power, okay? 
Then, he hears something unexpected. Yeah, that's, that's fine, yeah. The captain's gonna handle the power? What kind of plan is that? They're starting to deviate from standard procedures by doing things like, like splitting uh, command of the aircraft or control of the aircraft, which is not a good idea. Normally, the pilot flying the plane would be the one adjusting the engine throttles. If someone else is making those changes, there's going to be a delay in the response from the pilot flying, an unnecessary and undesired response. OK. But it's not only that decision that seems off. There's also something odd about the sound of the engines. The cockpit voice recorder can also give you a lot of information about the acceleration of the engines, the engines being powered up, the engines being powered down. So you can actually glean quite an amount of information about that. Go out. Go out. Can you try and just bring up the engine sounds? Sounds like those two engines were operating at different power levels. The difficulty in, in this situation is that it's a twin engine aircraft, so the cockpit voice recorder will tell you something is going on, but it doesn't tell you which engine it actually is. Searching for something that could explain the mysterious sounds coming from the engines, Liddy studies engine performance data from the flight recorder. It confirms his suspicion. The left engine was producing more power than the right engine something not uncommon on prop planes like the Metro 3. Uneven engine thrust does make it slightly more difficult to keep the plane flying level, especially at low air speeds. It's one more thing for pilots to think about during a complicated landing. Wait a minute. Liddy notices something even more troubling. It looks like engine number one went into reverse. Turboprop engines use the angle or pitch of the blades to change the direction of airflow. The propeller has an angle and through rotation takes a bite out of air like a, a screw. When selecting reverse, what's happening to the propeller pitch is it's flattening out and going into a negative blade angle, causing air to be pushed forward instead of aft. That is one thing you, you don't want to happen in flight because it can actually reduce the airplane to below its stalling speed so the airplane will actually stall. The data suggests what the, heck? the captain brought the power levers back too far, putting the more powerful left engine into reverse. If one were to do that in flight, you're going to have a forward moment on the right wing, you're going to have an aft moment on the left wing. And in this case, it caused a severe roll to the left. Go around. The captain immediately tried to correct his mistake by pushing the throttles forward. But again, the uneven engine thrust caught him off guard. Left engine powered up faster pushed them over to the right. That roll was, and yaw was quite vicious and actually caused the airplane to go right over on his side. I took control of the air power. After two aborted landings, perhaps the captain was trying to help the first officer deal with the power imbalance by taking control of the throttles. OK, minimum. But it only made matters worse. If the first officer, who was the pilot flying, had had control of the power levers and the yoke, the flight controls, he would have felt and known where the power levers were at. It makes the, the, the whole task of, of steering the aircraft much more difficult because you don't have control over the power. The Canadian Arctic is one of the toughest environments on the planet. Winters here are brutal. Eight months long, with temperatures plunging to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Even now, during the long days of the Arctic summer, the average temperature is barely above freezing. There are no roads to this part of the world. 
Virtually the only way to get here is by air. Resolute Bay Airport is the only one in the region equipped with navigational aids for automated landing approaches. First Air Flight 6560 is a charter flying passengers and cargo to the small community. Wind 180 degrees at eight knots. First Officer David Hare studied business before setting his sights on aviation. He joined First Air four years ago. First Air 6560, copy, thank you. Uh, there we go. Captain Blair Rutherford has been with the airline for more than 15 years. Might as well do yours too. Heading 029 degrees. Got it. This close to the magnetic North Pole, pilots need to calibrate their compasses frequently using their GPS. Okay, let's go over the approach. Okay. Altitude alert set to 2200. Because of the heavy fog, the crew will be relying on their autopilot during the approach. Checklist complete. Autopilot. Set. This way, they don't have to worry about lining up with a runway visually. The computer will do all the work until they're ready to touch down. You're landing on runway 35 true. It's a little wet. There's stairs 6560, copy 35 true. We were 10 miles from runway. At 11.40 a.m., flight 6560 begins its final approach to the runway. Descending through 1,000 feet. First stair 6560, we're three miles out on final. Uh, we're over the shoreline now. All right. Oh, up. The sound of an urgent alarm fills the cockpit. Oh, go around, go for it. It's the low altitude warning. To the pilots, it seems impossible. They don't even have the runway in sight yet. Go around. Go around thrust. The captain decides to abort the landing. But it may be too late. Flight 6560 slams into the ground at 180 miles an hour. The plane skids across the crest of a hill and bursts into flames. The priority now, get help to any survivors. Think to yourself, wow, I, I really hope someone survived this, but you know this is gonna be bad. At the crash site, Gabrielle Pelkey sits alone in a nightmare. She found herself uh, with a broken leg, cuts and bruises, and, and concern for, for her little sister, Cheyenne. Geologist Nicole Williamson has also survived. Wow. Gabrielle. Gabrielle. Oh, thank God. When Nicole got to Gabrielle... You're okay. You're okay. She made sure that Gabrielle was kept warm, and, and that was something that uh, probably helped her with her own survival. This is my first plane crash. <laughs> yeah. Me too, sweetie. Me too. For Nicole to hear that from, from a child, it sort of brought home, you know, the, the innocence of it all. Okay. All right. Trying to survive it at that moment, and it was a way of focusing on each other. As they stumble through the wreckage, they find only one other survivor, Robin Wiley. 
they managed to get to a location where they felt, okay, this is probably a safe location, and wait and hope for the best. The three survivors are suffering from shock and shivering in near freezing temperatures. If help doesn't arrive soon, they may die from exposure. News of the disaster reaches air crash investigators still in flight, including the TSP's Brian McDonald. We kind of looked at each other in disbelief, as if, you know, is somebody changing the start of the, of the exercise to create more realism, or is this really happening? We need to hit the ground running. Now you're quickly changing gears into thinking about all the things we have to do now to get ready and start reacting to this actual accident. As the investigators touch down, they grapple with the realization that the mock exercise they were expecting is now a very real catastrophe. But there is some good news. Because of Operation Nanook, rescuers are able to reach the survivors just 20 minutes after the accident. There are survivors. I repeat, there are survivors. Having been to several aircraft crashes throughout my 20-year my 20, 20 career, um, shock would be an understatement that these people had survived. They didn't appear to have any life-threatening injuries, so we elected to fairly rapidly stabilize some immediate fractures, get them on some stretchers, and get them down to a facility that could uh, properly um, evaluate and, and treat them in, in an environment that was more stable. Rescuers comb through the wreckage, but they quickly realize no one else has survived the crash. Twelve people are dead. Passing the airport, the pilots descend below the minimum safe altitude of 5,000 feet. As they turn back towards the runway, they suddenly lose sight of the runway lights. You go into the dark, and then you completely uh, miss your references. The pilots don't realize that a hill is blocking their view because the hill isn't on their chart. Losing the visual sight of the airport would cause the pilots to look even further and lose more altitude. Before they even know they're in danger, it's too late. As they begin their descent with no tower to guide them, Captain Gapke's radio communications are critical. King Air 1127. Delta's taxiing out, uh, takeoff on runway four. They're using four. A King Air A90, a much smaller twin turboprop, is taxiing out to runway four. King Air 1127, Delta holding short of runway four, be uh, to take in the runway for departure. The commuter plane is now 90 seconds to touchdown. 500. The King Air is in position and holding. On short final for runway 13. 400. The aircraft gonna hold in position on runway four, or you guys gonna take off? 700. 746 Juliet holding for departure on runway four. 200. Yeah, King Air. Okay, we'll get through your intersection in just a second, sir. We appreciate that. Finals are complete. At the same moment, flight instructor Paul Walker is in a hangar at Quincy Airport. Max reverse. Oh, Christ. What the hell? We heard this explosion that, that rattled the walls and windows shook. And as I came outside, what I saw looked like a mushroom cloud from when you see the films of the atomic bombs going off. At Quincy Airport, Paul Walker rushes toward burning wreckage on the runway. I would say I was at the crash site in less than a minute and a half. 
As he draws closer to the fire, Walker makes a bone-chilling discovery. It's not only the King Air engulfed in flames. Two planes are on fire. Open the door! Please! Someone help! <coughs> Open the door! <coughs> Open the door! Another pilot comes to help Walker on the runway. <coughs> The main exit, an air stair door, is directly behind the cockpit. I grabbed the handle and attempted to open the door. I tried everything that I could do in the world, and I could not get that door to unlatched. I can't do this. I'm going to get help. <laughs> Leaving the airplane was one of the more difficult things I've ever done in my life. When I looked at the captain, there was part of me that knows that she knew that by the time I got back, it would be, it would be too late. That, that I was literally their last hope. Please. Moments later, all hope for the crash survivors is lost. It was easily less than two minutes from the time I was standing by the left wing till it exploded. I felt like I failed. Despite Paul Walker's heroic efforts, four pilots and 10 passengers are dead. It's one of the worst runway accidents in North American history. 14 people are dead after a fiery crash. NTSB investigators are under the gun. Nora Marshall is an expert in crash survival factors. Why no one escaped Flight 5925 is a puzzle she wants to solve. The thing that stands out in my mind is that these people had a chance if the exits had opened to survive. The air stair door now becomes the focus of Marshall's investigation. Yeah, I'm 100% sure that's it. As the first person to reach the door, Paul Walker's testimony is key. He's certain he found the handle in the 6 o'clock or open position. Finding the handle in the 6 o'clock position suggested to me that the first officer had moved the handle to the open position. It's the first officer's responsibility to open the exit doors. Someone help! Emergency procedures call for the captain to shut down the airplane while the evacuation is underway. I can't get it open! Open the door! <coughs> Had the air stair door opened right away, it may have allowed everybody off the airplane. <laughs> Twelve lives might have been saved if only the door had opened. <laughs> To know that they survived an accident and weren't able to get out is hard. It's very hard. So with a handle like this, the door should open. The focus now shifts to the mechanics of the door itself. Fire in the cabin severely damaged the door frame. But the main components have all been recovered. OK, let's see what this can tell us. The locking mechanism is simple, with three cam locks on each side. A single cable connects the door handle to the cams. When the handle turns, the cable rotates all the cams to lock or unlock the door. The cams have to rotate about 150 degrees from the locked position for the door to be open. We found that the cams were all either locked or partially locked. What could have prevented them from unlocking? What have we here? Marshall discovers the locking cable is fractured. This could be the smoking gun she's been looking for. With the cable having been snapped, you would want to understand that because if it was not intact, it wasn't going to rotate the cams. But confirming the theory requires more analysis. If she can prove that the cable snapped on impact, Marshall will have solved the mystery of the jammed door that cost 12 people their lives. I can't get it open! 
Lab tests on the cable that locks and unlocks the main door are a disappointment. The critical component did not break on impact. The cable had broken, and the metallurgist determined that that was a result of heat and stress from the post-crash fire. Hurry, hurry! Okay, okay, hang on! In other words, the critical cable didn't break until after the fire killed everyone on board. What jammed the door is still a mystery. Asiana Flight 214 is nearing the end of an overnight flight from Seoul, Korea to San Francisco. Ben Levy is a frequent flyer returning home. I fly pretty often for business or visiting my family. I'm originally from France, and so, you know, I fly long distance a lot. I fly in and out of SFO a lot. So I know the airport very well. Many of the other 291 passengers are Chinese including a group of teenagers on their way to summer camp in the United States. Asiana 214 Heavy, runway 28 left, cleared to land. Landing checklist complete, clear to land, on glide path. The pilots check a set of lights beside the runway that can help guide them to a safe landing. Check. The plane is less than a minute from the runway when Ben Levy realizes something is wrong. I remember noticing that there's a small pier that extends out of the runway. And I'm like, wow, we're very low. And I dismissed the thought thinking, well, what can go wrong? There's all the technology on board to make sure that those guys don't, don't mess up. In the cockpit. Speed! A crisis hits. I've got control. Oh, God, go around! The captain pulls up the nose and tries to climb. has torn the tail off the body of the plane. An engine is burning. If fire spreads to the fuel tanks, the plane could explode. Let's see if we can open this door. But getting down to the ground will not be easy. I'm expecting at that point to see a slide open. Right, the whole like, hey, you open the door, the slide is gonna open, and there's no slide. Whoa, okay. Help each other! Come on! Luckily, some crumpled pieces of the fuselage have formed a makeshift set of stairs. Ben Levy stays by the door to help the other passengers climb down. Come on! At San Francisco International Airport, runway 28L is a disaster zone. Fire crews battle to keep flames from consuming the fuselage of Asiana Flight 214. With rescuers now on board to help the injured, Ben Levy finally heads to safety. Investigators search for a lead in the crash of Asiana 214. Air traffic controllers provide some answers. Uh, visibility was 10 miles, um, a few clouds, uh, not an issue. Controllers tell investigators that it was a normal day except for the fact that some runway equipment was not in operation. And that runway's glide slope was, was out of service. Electronic equipment installed on runways can send signals to a plane's autopilot. The signals can help guide the plane down at a precise angle. But the main runway at the airport is under construction, and the equipment is switched off. It's a revealing discovery. A combination of high traffic and compact runways have earned San Francisco Airport a reputation for difficult landings. To manage the high traffic, controllers often ask pilots to come in fast and steep 
leaving lower altitudes open for departing planes to climb out. Very often we are given what we call the slam dunk approach, where we're, we're high and we have to get down quickly. And it, it does create a little bit of a challenge. All right, so there's San Francisco Airport. Palo Alto's down here, you know. Roger Cox knows firsthand how challenging landing at San Francisco Airport can be. I can say from my own personal experience flying in there many, many times that it's very easy to get high and hot, uh, and you have to really uh, stay on top of the airplane. Asiana 214 Heavy, runway 28 left, cleared to land. It all leads to some troubling questions. Were the Asiana pilots flying into danger? Did they face an extraordinary risk at an airport notorious for difficult landings? So he'd be coming in from this direction, straight across the bay. Roger Cox studies airport radar records. He wants to know if controllers assigned Asiana Flight 214 an approach that was too fast and steep to fly safely. Clear to land. There were some complaints initially from the operator that this crew was being asked to do something was unreasonable. So we wanted to spend quite a bit of time looking at whether that was true. Same instructions, same approach. No one else had a problem. Airport records reveal controllers gave two other planes the same instructions just before Asiana touched down. Both landed safely. You can't fault the controller. And they managed to land 777s safely without any difficulty. So although it is a, a somewhat challenging environment, we found that nothing that ATC did really caused the accident. It's another dead end. For now, what brought down Asiana 214 remains a mystery. It's a quiet Sunday evening at Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. Everybody ready for takeoff? Mm, it's all looking good. An LL cargo jet is fueled and ready to depart for Tel Aviv. The freighter's four massive Pratt & Whitney engines pump out 200,000 pounds of thrust. LL 1862, climb flight level 210. Flight level 210, roger. The controller clears them for a climb to 21,000 feet. Everything seems normal for the first seven minutes of flight. What the hell? The 747 is rolling violently to the right. Both engines on the right wing have suddenly died. Speedbird 943, climb flight level 280. At Schiphol Air Traffic Control, the evening routine is about to be shattered. LL 1862. Mayday, Mayday, we have an emergency. LL 1862, do you wish to return to Schiphol? Affirmative. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Turn right, heading 260. The crew now has a heading back to the airport. But with hydraulics failing, the captain is having more and more difficulty controlling the plane. Flight 1862 is less than three minutes from landing. The plane is once again rolling to the right, and this time it's worse. LL, further right heading 310. Heading 310. Controllers urge the pilots to correct their course to the runway. I can't hold it. I can't hold it. Uh, we have a controlling problem. No, no, no. Come on. Going down. Going down. 1862 going down. Going down. Come on. LL 
1862 has slammed into an 11-story apartment block. The Beale Murmur apartment complex, home to thousands of people, is engulfed in flames. The next morning, daylight reveals the overwhelming scale of the disaster. The plummeting jet has cut the apartment block completely in two. There's almost nothing left of the plane. No one aboard has survived. Dig in, guys! We need those black boxes! Robert Benson is a veteran investigator with the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board. He knows the team and knows just how crucial the voice and data recorders can be. We use those extensively, along with examination of wreckage, to nail down uh, almost to an nth degree what happened sometimes. Investigators face a difficult search through a tangled mess of pulverized aircraft parts and building debris. Hang on. That's an engine part. It goes over there. While investigators sort through the mountains of debris, witness reports provide a stunning lead. The earliest information that I think the investigators had, which gave them clues that there was more to this crash than just the pilots losing power on two engines, was that witnesses saw things happening to the airplane and they reported this. Just minutes before the crash, they saw what looked like two jet engines falling into Lake Hoymere, east of the airport. Two engines in this lake. Let's find them, please. Two engines were missing, and that became the focus of the investigation. Divers immediately take to the water in search of the fallen debris. What they find could solve this mystery. Within hours, the search of Lake Hoymere pays off. Investigators recover one of Flight 1862's right side engines. A look at the serial number reveals it's engine number four. The 747's engines are numbered from left to right. Number four is the outermost engine on the right wing. Searchers also recover debris from the forward edge of the right wing, control surfaces that are crucial for controlling the plane. Um, we've got... The loss of leading edge components, uh, flaps and slats, led us to believe that the aircraft was extremely difficult to fly uh, safely. The mystery now is what caused the engines to fall off. Was it terrorism, a mechanical failure, or something else? Investigators rush the recovered wreckage to a forensic lab and test it for explosive residue. You have to look at every single part to either rule it in or out. But there's no evidence of any explosion. We looked at every single part and ruled out a missile. One thing is now certain. The LL disaster has nothing to do with terrorism. But with engine three still missing, the case is far from being solved. It's early morning on the Indonesian island of Java. A Boeing 737 flies high overhead. The crew of Garuda Flight 200 is getting ready to land. There are 133 passengers in the cabin. They're nearing the end of a short flight from the Indonesian capital of Jakarta, 265 miles southeast of the city of Yogyakarta. Kyle Quinlan is also headed to Yogyakarta. He's an Air Force security officer. I was working for 34 VLP squadron. They're the guys who look after the security for Prime Minister, the heads of government and stuff like that. We had to travel internally on civilian aircraft. The plane is less than 15 miles from the airport. 
Whoa, strong wind. They hit some slight turbulence. Garuda 200, you're clear to approach runway 09er. Let me know when you have the runway in sight. Copy that. The bumpy ride doesn't alarm the experienced captain. Flaps one. He continues with a landing approach. Flaps one. And calls for the flaps to be extended. Flaps increase the wing surface area, adding the crucial extra lift needed at slower speeds. As the plane descends, Quinlan begins to feel uneasy. His Air Force training tells him something's not right. When you travel on aircraft so frequent, you become aware of, of your surroundings. And for me, it was when we were just standing and looking out the window and thinking, we're not supposed to be at this height for how fast we were going. There's something's off, man. Huh? Clear the land, two miles out. Quinlan can't shake the feeling. The plane's dropping too fast. What can you do? You, you're stuck here, you know? Like, there's nothing that you can do except for tighten up the seatbelt and just hang on and, and just ride this out, and hopefully we make it, you know? Whoa. Go around, Captain. Go around. We, we landed and, and um, we bounced. It's chaos as the plane bounces a second time. And I just remember thinking, just hang on, hang on, boy, hang on. Then a third impact, and the plane isn't stopping. We're scraping on the belly. I can hear the wings, the engines, everything. Many passengers are badly injured, and the fire is spreading fast. Kyle Kunlin realizes there's no time to wait for rescue. Once we pulled up, I had to operate, and to see so many people who were busted up and couldn't do anything, I needed to do something and, and help these people out. Investigators search for clues to explain why Garuda Flight 200 crashed. Was the plane configured properly? Perhaps there was something wrong with the wing flaps pilots rely on for landing. The flap system on a modern jetliner like a 737 create greater lift. And, and that means that we can approach an airport or we can take off from an airport with a much lower and safer airspeed. The team scrutinizes the mechanical rods or screw jacks that move the flaps. We needed to look at the flap setting. What flap setting? can we establish from the wreckage. We measured the screw jack extension to establish what the flap setting was. What they find is astonishing. Doesn't look like the flaps are all the way out. The screw jacks show a flap setting of just five degrees, not nearly enough for a safe landing. We just could not believe that the aircraft would have landed with only five degrees. To provide enough lift on landing, the flaps of a 737 are usually extended step by step from zero all the way to 40 degrees as the plane slows and descends towards the runway. It's hard to overstate the value of the flap systems on a modern jetliner. Investigators aren't sure how the flaps ended up at only five degrees. The flap mechanism was damaged in the crash and may have moved on impact. To be certain of how the flaps were set, they need to know what's on the flight recorders. We need that data from the black boxes. Some of that data is proving elusive. Australian technicians have been unable to download the cockpit voice recording. It's a huge blow. Desperate to hear what's on the device, investigators send it to the US manufacturer hoping experts there can recover the recording. 
So steps were taken to hand carry the recorder to the factory so that the data could be downloaded. Crash investigators are having better luck with the second black box, the flight data recorder. They've managed to download all of its stored information. We were able to get information about the flap settings, the speed on the approach, the thrust reverser deployment, the dynamics of the approach and landing itself. The data reveals the 737 was coming in for its landing blazingly fast. Flight 200 hit the ground at over 250 miles an hour, more than 100 miles an hour faster than normal. We're not stopping! This is a ridiculous amount of speed to approach an airport with, uh, with the intent of landing. The plane's speed at impact is so fast, it bounces twice before skidding into the rice field. The speed of the aircraft on short final and on touchdown is so excessive, there was no way it was going to stop. But why did the pilots touch down on the runway at such a catastrophically high speed? Pull up the data for the flaps, would you please? There. The flaps were set for five degrees. Never more than five degrees. The data confirms what the screwjack suggested to investigators. The flaps on Flight 200's wings were in a bizarre position one that is never used during landing. UPS-6 has crashed into a military base 10 miles from Dubai International Airport. Neither pilot has survived. It's one of Dubai's worst ever aviation disasters. Beyond the outer edge of the wreckage field, investigators make an unexpected find. We looked outside the burned area and saw this little shrub maybe three feet high, just sitting out by itself in the dirt, burnt far away from the main area. Inside that bush was one small lithium battery that had burned, blown itself up, and shot out of the wreckage into the little bush. The small piece of evidence suggests a terrifying new theory. The cargo manifest reveals UPS-6 had dozens of shipments of lithium batteries or consumer electronics that contained them. 81,000 batteries. That's a lot of hazardous cargo. Once we had got the cargo manifest and seen the total volume of, of these batteries that were on board, we were heading in the right direction. Lithium batteries are extremely flammable. They can provide up to 10 times the energy of regular alkaline batteries, which is why they last longer in electronics. But their volatile chemical composition means they can burst into flames if they're damaged. Is that what happened in the cargo hold of UPS Flight 6? Joseph Panahiatu is a fire and explosive expert for the NTSB. There's been instances where they're trying to load a pallet of cargo which contains a lot of batteries and it catches on fire at the airport before getting onto the airplane. So we, we're aware that that is a possibility. You can't automatically conclude that that's what it is, but it's one of the prime suspects. Demand for lithium batteries has never been higher. Several billion are manufactured and shipped around the world every year. Lithium batteries are on everything that we do. They're in our cars, they're in our homes, they're in every airplane we get on, they are everywhere. At a testing facility in the United States, Straker runs lab tests to explore just how flammable lithium batteries can be. The results are astonishing. When they heat a single box containing 100 batteries, it quickly ignites, sending up flames that reach temperatures of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. We were completely surprised at how a small AA sized lithium battery would uh, overheat and then vent and practically just explode into a, a problem which you couldn't contain. The black box flight data of UPS-6 has been downloaded. 
Investigators study each parameter, trying to reconstruct how the plane broke down over time. The next step is to map the failures and use them to trace the path of the fire. The data paints a vivid picture of an intense fire that burned through the cargo hold at a critical location. All the failures are right here behind the cockpit. So what was in the containers beneath those systems? Bingo. Lithium batteries. In the crowded cargo deck, the flames soon spread to other containers, many of which also contained batteries. Fire, main deck forward. By the time the crew gets a warning, the fire is already burning too intensely for the suppression system to put it out. The manual flight control system is in the direct path of the fire. Luckily, the autopilot system is not. It can still send electrical signals directly to the servos that operate the plane's controls. But when the pilot switches off the autopilot, the plane becomes nearly impossible to fly. I have no pitch control of the airplane. Fire quickly destroys more systems, including the captain's oxygen supply and the landing gear controls. I have no gear. But Straker believes that tragedy would have been even worse if not for the final actions of the first officer. 300 feet, any runway is available. At the last moment, in a plane he could barely control. If able, climb immediately, climb immediately. He manages to narrowly avoid a suburb of Dubai. Investigators have one final question. The 747's cargo area is equipped with a flame-resistant liner. It wraps the entire cargo hold in a protective shield. It should have protected the critical systems. Investigators need to know why the cargo liner failed. It's now certain that an intense fire fueled by a large cargo of batteries crippled UPS Flight 6. To find out how fire could have burned through the plane's protective cargo liner, investigators conduct another dramatic test. The cargo liner failed. The flames spread quickly, eating through vital control systems. The final report highlights the need for better smoke detectors and fire extinguishers in cargo holds. It also calls for new fire-resistant cargo containers. At UPS, the entire company mourned the loss of their colleagues. Even before the report came out, they took steps to keep their pilots safer. The company is testing a new cargo container that can withstand a 1,200 degree fire for up to four hours. UPS has also improved safety in the cockpit. The new system creates a sealed air bubble for the pilots that allows them to see both their instruments and the view ahead if the cockpit ever fills with smoke. Sao Paulo, Brazil is the largest city in South America. With 16 million residents, morning rush hour is always a crawl. The traffic overhead is busy too. Residential neighborhoods are packed tight around Congonhas Airport, one of Brazil's busiest hubs. Every day, more than 500 flights come and go from this airport. Today, 89 passengers are getting ready for a short hop from Sao Paulo to Rio de Janeiro. They're flying on TAM Airlines. The Brazilian company has just won an award for best regional carrier and wants everyone to know it. Good morning. How are you doing? Great. One of TAM's most experienced pilots is in command. Jose Antonio Moreno has almost 6,500 flight hours. Before start checklist? Yes, Captain. Already done. Good. 
Go ahead and call the tower so we can get these engines started. You got it. First Officer Ricardo Luis Gomez is less experienced. The 27-year-old has only been qualified to fly the Fokker 100 for one week. Sao Paulo, TAM 402, we're ready to go and requesting engine start. TAM 402, you're cleared to start. Fire him up. Starting number one. Starting engine two. The short haul jet is powered by twin Rolls Royce engines. Flight 402 is underway. V1, rotate. It seems like a routine takeoff. No, 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 no. Then, less than 50 feet in the air, the plane rolls dangerously right. The captain needs to level the plane fast. The captain's efforts start to pay off. The wings move back towards level. What was that? It's a brief reprieve. The airspeed is dropping dangerously low. Worse, the captain can't keep the plane level. It has to be an absolutely sick feeling for that flight crew at that point. It's been three days since TAM Flight 402 crashed on takeoff. Now, with the help of black box data, investigators may soon know why. The flight recorder has captured dozens of parameters about the Fokker 100 short flight. But will it be enough to tell them why the plane rolled so suddenly out of control? As they study the data, investigators immediately notice something unusual. Look at engine number two. The power's all over the place. Can you bring up all the data on the thrust reversers? There's another parameter investigators are eager to see. Okay, so you, so you saw something moving at the back of the engine. A witness told investigators he saw one of the plane's thrust reversers operating just before the crash. Thrust reversers are buckets deployed on landing to redirect the flow of engine exhaust, pushing it forward to help the plane slow down. Pilots never use them in the air. If a thrust reverser did somehow deploy in flight, it could easily cause the type of steep right roll that doomed Flight 402. For investigators, witness accounts aren't enough. They need hard evidence. They soon find it in the flight data. There. Just after takeoff, the right thrust reverser moves back and forth twice and then stays in the dangerous deployed position. This shouldn't even be possible. Investigators test the actuators that move the reversers, looking for a failure that might explain why one of them opened during flight. But there's no sign of any malfunction. They also test the electronics that detect when the plane's wheels are safely on the ground. They need to check every circuit. The exhaustive effort pays off with the discovery of a faulty sensor. It was failing intermittently, signaling the reverser to open and close. The result was chaos in the cockpit. The sensor failure was intermittent. So, the buckets, the buckets open and close 
and opened again. But there's one big problem with what investigators have uncovered. The Fokker 100 has an additional safety net that should have kept the plane safe even after the sensor failed. If a faulty thrust reverser deploys on takeoff, power to the affected engine is supposed to drop to idle automatically to prevent the reverser from acting as a brake. No alarm sounds in the cockpit, but the safety system kicks in immediately. The pilots don't have to do a thing. The Fokker 100 has more than enough power to climb safely on just one engine. So the question remains, why didn't Flight 402 make it safely away from Congonias? After being delayed for more than an hour, Span Air Flight 5022 is finally getting back underway. There are 166 passengers on board, many of them looking to escape the stifling heat of Madrid in August. Everyone was full of anticipation. Everyone wanted to be on their way. Anna Stefanides has come to Spain from Sweden. She is on her way to the Canary Islands to meet some friends. Most of Europe has holidays, different summer holidays in August. I was going to Gran Canaria to meet my girlfriends. We were going to have one week's holidays, four ladies. Spanair 5022, Joe Nexon line on runway 36 left. Okay, here we go. At 2.23, the MD-82 aircraft starts speeding down the runway. One hundred. The captain watches their speed. They can't lift off until they reach 157 knots. Takeoff speed. V1. Rotate. An alarm warns the pilots something is going wrong. Engine failure? officer increases power, but he's losing control of the pipe. How the hell do you turn off that warning? The plane is less than 40 feet from the ground. I managed to think, this is my last trip. I've had a good life. I thought, now I die. Fly the plane. Fly it. Oh, God. Just seconds after takeoff, Flight 5022 slams into a riverbank beside the runway. The plane, with 172 people on board, is now shattered wreckage spread over half a mile. Investigators into the crash of Span Air Flight 5022 immediately focus their efforts on recovering the plane's two black boxes, or flight recorders. Once they download the data, it could provide vital clues about what went wrong. At the crash site, marks on the ground paint a vivid picture. Here's our first impact. Revealing just how quickly Flight 5022 turned to disaster. The first impact marks are just 200 feet from the runway. The plane then passed over a road and slid another 1,800 feet before crashing on the far side of a river. The timing immediately suggests a theory that might explain the crash. Let's take a look at this engine. Engine power is especially crucial during the first few moments of flight. 
If the plane doesn't have enough power, it won't achieve the speed it needs to overcome drag and get airborne. Investigators study the engines, searching for any sign of malfunction. Both are filled with debris, mud and grass ingested during the crash. The finding means the engines were spinning at high speed when they hit the ground. It was an engine failure that doomed the plane. Right. The engines were fine. But something stopped that plane from climbing. Investigators need a new theory to explain why the MD-82 couldn't climb. What was it? I want maintenance records, weather reports, pilot records, the works. Let's get to work, people. OK, let's see what the numbers tell us. Investigators know that for any takeoff, the plane's weight and balance must be carefully calculated. They review the passenger manifest, cargo, and fuel load. They need to check the total weight, as well as where the loads were carried, to see if the plane's center of gravity shifted dangerously forward or back. But it's soon clear this isn't the smoking gun they're looking for. Well, there's nothing wrong with their takeoff weight. Controllers in the tower provide a more promising lead. They tell investigators that the Spanair crew called off an earlier takeoff. They had some kind of maintenance issue right before takeoff. The plane was at the threshold of the runway when the pilots noticed a temperature gauge was giving them faulty readings. Madrid Spanair 5022, we have a slight problem. We have to exit the runway. 5022. Taxi to Apron Tango to Estan Romeo 11. Controllers cleared the MD-82 to return to the terminal. Could the last minute repair be the key to explaining the crash of Flight 5022? Investigators need to know. Atlantic Southeast Airlines Flight 2311 cruises at 15,000 feet. It's the Braves' year. I feel it. Sorry, I don't want to get my hopes up. Last year still hurts. <laughs> At the controls is Captain Mark Friedline. The 34-year-old is an experienced pilot with almost 12,000 flight hours. The flight attendant prepares the cabin for landing. Runway's in sight. The crew is just five minutes from touching down. ASA 2311, cleared direct to Jeff 1. Linco, report the airport in sight. Expect the visual. We do have it in sight, 2311. Slow in for approach speed. The aircraft was normal. There was nothing unexpected. Gear down. Gear down. Three green. Then, the captain notices an unusual sound. It's weird. Number one seems to be spinning faster. The left is, left is pulling a bit more. Bringing power down to the left. Captain Friedline tries to compensate for the plane's unexplained pull to the left. Flight 2311 is less than 1,000 feet from the ground and the plane is getting more and more difficult to control. What's going on? Do you see anything? There's nothing. What's going on with this thing? I can't hold it. Get out of it! I can't. Come on! The plane is rolling to the left, and the crew doesn't know why. Come on! God! I can't! Captain Friedline fights desperately to save his plane. Come on! No! No! That's it. Go, oh, God. It's no use. Investigators begin the painstaking task of sorting through the wreckage of Flight 2311. 
They're searching for any evidence that might hint at why the Embraer 120 rolled sharply to the left and crashed, killing everyone on board. Deep inside the propeller unit, investigators uncover an important clue. Aha! There you are. We have a witness mark. Take a look. There's a small mark where two parts of the propeller mechanism slammed together on impact. The witness mark might be enough to tell investigators how the propellers were operating. The marks tell Ritter the exact angle of the blades when the plane slammed into the ground. These guys had a big problem with their left propeller. The blades were almost flat. The left side propeller blades are at a dangerously low angle, one that is never used during flight. At three degrees, the blades are so flat they would act like a wall, blocking the flow of air the plane needs to maintain lift. Investigators study the mechanism used to control the left propeller. Will you look at this? They make a disturbing discovery. It's completely worn down. The teeth on a key piece of the gear mechanism, known as the quill, are almost entirely worn away. Investigators may finally have the lead they've been looking for. This is what it's supposed to look like. With its teeth worn away, the quill can't lock onto the gear system that controls the angle of the propeller blades. The discovery might explain why the propeller blades slipped to such a dangerously low angle. Once we noticed that the quill teeth were severely worn, we started theorizing what would happen in that type of situation. And it was pretty clear that control of the propeller blade angles could be lost. Ritter is certain he's found the critical clue. Worn down teeth on the quill that could have allowed the propeller blades to slip to a dangerous angle. But he soon learns there's a big problem with his theory. The manufacturer says it's impossible. Engineers at Hamilton Standard included a fail-safe feature when they designed the propeller. It should be impossible for the blades to go flat during flight. If there's ever a problem with the mechanism controlling the angle, the blades are designed to move on their own to what's called the feathered position. A feathered propeller can't endanger the safety of the flight. This has got to be it. This has to be connected somehow. But Ritter isn't convinced by the manufacturer's assurances. His gut tells him the worn quill did allow the propeller blades to move to a dangerous angle. But without flight data, his investigation has hit a wall. He has no way to prove the quill brought down Flight 2311. What's going on? Can you see anything? There's nothing. <laughs> It's 7.20 a.m. High above the jagged coast of Norway, the crew of Atlantic Airways 670 reaches the peak altitude for a short 15-minute flight. Next up is a quick stop on the island of Stord to pick up a few more before flying on to their final destination at Molde on the mainland coast. Stored Airport is perched on the edge of a rugged island, with rocky cliffs bordering the runway on three sides. There's very little margin for error. Overshoot the runway, and you could end up in the sea below. Shortly before touchdown, the crew makes a last-minute change. They want to approach stored single runway from the southern end, known as runway 33, rather than circling around to land from the north end, known as runway 15. Control Atlantic 670. We'd like to do a visual into runway 33. Affirmative 670, the runway is free. You are cleared for a visual approach. Runway 33. 
The straight-in approach will put the airplane on the ground in less than five minutes. What's our landing speed? 112 knots. The crew now enters the busiest time in any flight. Set speed for final. They must simultaneously shed altitude and speed. Speed set. Flaps 20. And prepare the plane for touchdown. Flaps 20. Gear down. Gear is down. Flaps to full. Flaps full. Flight 670 is just one minute from the runway. Reducing thrust. The plane touches down at 7.32 a.m. And spoilers. No spoilers. We're not stopping. Speed! Flight 670 is running out of runway. Desperate to stop his plane, Captain Yerhus takes drastic measures. Hang on! He throws the plane into a sharp turn first right, then left, hoping to skid to a stop. We're going over! A local resident records the terrifying scene as aviation fuel burns out of control. It takes fire crews nearly two hours to quench the flames. Four people are dead. Both pilots have survived, but it could have been much worse. Air traffic controllers at Stored Airport can't explain why Atlantic Airways Flight 670 careened over a cliff. The other flight had no problem. An identical plane landed safely on the same runway just 25 minutes before the crash. Sven Erik Strandberg was piloting that plane. It was not that wet. It was just a little bit damp, so we didn't notice uh, very much on landing at all. So it was uneventful. The idea that a wet runway was to blame just doesn't seem to add up. Uh, describe how the landing looked uh, to you. But investigators get a new lead when they talk to some of the firefighters who saw Flight 670 land. Several report seeing a trail of mist streaming from the plane's wings after it touched down. The witnesses stated that they saw wing vortexes from, uh, from the aircraft. Uh, for us, this uh, is one evidence that the lift spoilers were not working as intended. When an airplane is in flight, the wings create trails of turbulent air known as wingtip vortices, but only while the wings are generating lift. In the air, you can actually see this, um, like, corkscrews following up from the wings. The 146 has six spoilers that should have deployed on touchdown to disrupt that lift and help the plane stick to the runway and stop. As soon as you select the spoilers, you will feel the airplane sink down towards the runway and you can apply the brakes. Did the spoilers on Flight 670 somehow fail to deploy? It may be a difficult question for the team to answer. All six of the plane spoilers were destroyed by fire. A United Nations transport plane, the Albertina, is on a vital mission in Central Africa. Estimate of beam and dole at 2347. 
Arrival time 0020. The destination is Indula Airport in the British colony of northern Rhodesia. Roger. Indola weather, wind 120 at 7 knots, visibility 5 to 10 miles with a slight smoke haze. Controllers and local dignitaries anxiously await the arrival of one of the most important people in the world. On board the DC-6 is UN Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld. At least they're willing to talk. What else do we know about their latest demands? He's flying in from the Congo to hold high-level peace talks with the rebel leader. The flight left the Congolese capital, Leopoldville, a little more than six hours ago. For security reasons, it's flown an indirect route to Ndola. To prevent an ambush, no flight plan has been filed, and the pilots have maintained radio silence for most of the flight. The mission is a closely guarded secret. Proceeding to Salisbury after Ndola. Negative. Even at this late stage, the crew needs to be secretive about the mission. Are you staying in Ndola? They don't know who might be listening in. Negative. Due to barking difficulties, would like to know your intentions. We will give them on the ground. Roger. Go ask the pilots how much longer till we land. The Secretary General and his delegation should be on the ground in about 10 minutes. Your light's in sight. Overhead, Andola. Descending. Uh, Roger. Report reaching 6,000 feet. Roger. OK, they're 10 minutes away. Because of the unusual flight path, the plane now needs to fly past Indola Airport and circle back to touch down on its only runway. The crew begins the final swooping left-hand turn that will line them up with a runway below. The mission to Andola is about to begin, a mission that could change the fate of nations. The ground in Andola, controllers are growing concerned. Albertina, Andola Tower, do you read? The Secretary General's plane is overdue. The controller contacts other airports in the region. Salisbury, Andola Airport. Have you had any word from the UN Albertina? Nothing at all. Perhaps the Albertina's secret mission has taken it to a different destination at the last minute. Lusaka, Indola Airport. Have you had any contact with the UN flight? Negative. No contact here. The plane carrying one of the most important men on the planet is missing. It's a mystery that will haunt Indola and the world for decades to come. Swedish air crash investigator Sven Hammerberg is entering a world of intrigue and deadly Cold War conspiracies. A special commission reporting to the UN needs him to determine whether a 1961 air disaster was an accident or an assassination. Well, the commission knew that I had some experience in that field of old aircraft accidents, so uh, they called me. In 2013, Sven Hammerberg joins a new search for the truth, gathering evidence to be presented to the United Nations. My task was to look into the details uh, and see if there were any new information available. And I was asked to evaluate the investigations that had been performed before. When I look into the basic facts around the crash, I look at the trees and the crash site and um, the statements over radio and so on. OK, now let's see the elevations. He studies the terrain around Andola Airport. He notes the height of the hills. 
He compares what he finds to what's shown on the chart used by the UN pilots. And he makes a shocking discovery. There's a hill here, a hill here, a hill here, but there's nothing marked here. Here, where the crash site is. The Andola chart does not show any obstacle or higher ground uh, west of the field. The crew might have been unaware of the height west of the field since there were, were no signs of it on the chart. Hammerberg also discovers that members of the crew flying the Secretary General to high-level peace talks had been on duty for 17 of the past 24 hours. Fatigue is an important factor here. The flight had lasted for six and a half hours. And there are signs that some of the crew were uh, quite exhausted even before the flight. For Hammerberg, the clues are beginning to add up. He feels close to solving a 50-year-old aviation mystery that has generated heated controversy the world over. After carefully reviewing all the evidence surrounding the crash of the Albertina in 1961, Sven Hammerberg believes he now knows what went wrong in the final three minutes of flight. And it has nothing to do with murder. Reaching the airfield and see the lights when you have been flying for six and a half hours, I think it's very easy for a pilot to get thinking that, oh, we are here, we're just going to land. Passing the airport, the pilots descend below the minimum safe altitude of 5,000 feet. As they turn back towards the runway, they suddenly lose sight of the runway lights. You go into the dark and then you completely uh, miss your references. The pilots don't realize that a hill is blocking their view because the hill isn't on their chart. Losing the visual sight of the airport would cause the pilots to look even further and lose more altitude. Before they even know they're in danger, it's too late. Gear up. Gear up. He pulled away from us and started to rotate. And in this case, there was something immediately not right. The climb is unusually steep. What's going on with that aircraft? It was almost stuttering in the air. K keep on that. Get the nose down! I'm trying! The plane is suddenly uncontrollable. The nose won't drop. My airplane! In a matter of seconds, the crew is in emergency mode. If they can't get the nose down fast, the plane will stall. We have a developing story, as you may have heard. There is a civilian Learjet. News of a rogue Learjet flying hundreds of miles off course has captivated the nation. The FAA began tracking aircraft in distress. Uh, the president um, was made aware of this situation this morning in a meeting with his economic advisors. Ben's in here. Experts at the National Transportation Safety Board are notified of the escalating emergency. Give me a map. Okay. Once the air traffic control system realized that the aircraft had gone rogue, so to speak, the next step is to try to figure out why. You can see they're being hijacked or it's malfunctioned. The crew has been incapacitated somehow. Controllers scramble F-16 fighters to track down the wayward Learjet. Jim Tidball has come up with a rough calculation of where the plane will run out of fuel. My best guess is South Dakota, possibly North Dakota. I can't say more than that. Let's hope he's right. With any luck, they won't hit anything.
In the air, the F-16 pilots have caught up with a rogue plane. The windows of the aircraft provide an ominous clue. No movement and the window's covered in frost. The Learjet is now a ghost plane. Can we narrow down the crash site anymore? With no hope for the passengers and crew, the only focus now is on where the plane will come down. According to calculations, the jet is almost out of fuel. At 10 minutes past 12, it happens. The Learjet carrying Payne Stewart and five of the people is falling from the sky. They're going down, they're going down. Where's it gonna hit? The F-16 attempts to follow, but the plane disappears into the clouds. It drops below the radar. Center, I've got a crash site. Payne Stewart's Learjet has slammed into a hayfield in South Dakota. There are no survivors. Can you breathe? No, but... Could the emergency oxygen system have somehow failed? For crash investigators, the oxygen masks should have given the crew enough air to breathe until they could land the plane. Benzin scours the Learjet's maintenance records. Looks like everything was working fine. He discovers that on several previous flights, the Learjet's crew used the masks without any problems. We did determine that the oxygen was on board and the crew could have used it. So now the question became, why didn't they use supplemental oxygen? Time to take a new approach. Set us to climb, please. Investigators need to learn more about what happened on board the Learjet after the crew's last radio call. They hope a simulation of the flight will help. There goes the cabin altitude warning. Start the clock. You've got maybe 15 seconds to do something once you become in a environment that's almost eliminated with oxygen. Emergency checklist, got it. I think all of us sort of had in our heads that you're going to put your oxygen mask on as the first and immediate action item. The simulated loss of cabin pressure leads Benzin to an astounding discovery. The first item on the emergency checklist is not put on oxygen masks. At 10,000 plus or minus 500 feet cabin altitude, control pressure to the outflow valve is trapped. This deactivates the automatic mode and stops cabin altitude from rising higher if the failure is in the automatic control system. I can't believe we still haven't put our oxygen masks on. We were surprised because it implied pretty strongly that you need to troubleshoot a pressurization problem. And if you can't fix it, then you don your oxygen masks. OK, shut it down. I think I know what happened. Investigators now have a theory about what went wrong on board the Learjet. Everything is fine till about 24,000 feet. Then something causes the plane to lose pressure. But before they can solve the problem, the crew loses consciousness. The Lear checklist, in a sense, a very real sense, could lead a crew astray. Without those masks on, they wouldn't stand a chance. The FAA is quick to respond. Put on oxygen masks is now the first item on the checklist, not just for Learjets, but for every similar plane in the sky. It's 9.35 AM, and traffic into Washington is getting congested. 
I was on my way from my parish to the Arlington National Cemetery for a graveside service. Father Stephen McGraw is stuck on a freeway right beside the Pentagon. I took that exit, actually, because I, I knew that the Pentagon was near uh, Arlington National Cemetery, and I couldn't remember how to get to Arlington National, so I thought, I can't be that far off. I'll take this exit. But in front of the building, there ended up being standstill traffic. And then without warning, there was a rush, feeling the vibrations or the sound. I just know there was, a, there was an overwhelming sense of something coming over the tops of our cars. The plane clipped a light pole as it went over the highway, and I turned instinctively to my right and to see just in time the plane coming in and um, just crashing into the building right, right in front of my eyes. these two huge billows of fire that came out of the two top windows of the Pentagon, and the fireballs just kind of billowed out. The symbol of US military might is now in flames. Smoke pours from a gaping 90-foot wide hole in the Pentagon's west wall. One entire section of the building has collapsed. I had not heard anything about the World Trade Center crashes. Didn't have my radio on, hadn't heard anything. And so I just assumed that this was an accident. There's no chance that any of the 64 people aboard the plane have survived the impact. And there are sure to be many more dead among Pentagon staff. Father McGraw rushes towards the devastation. He wants to help anyone he can. And we're coming to one man in particular. He said, what is your name? I'm Father McGraw. I'll stay with you. And he said, I'm Catholic. And so I actually gave him, in those moments, the uh, sacraments um, and anointed him on his forehead with the blessed oil, the oil of the sick. And when I did that, I remember saying to him, Jesus is I with tell you, Jesus is with you now. Nine eleven shook us to our core. Anybody that was of age during that time, it's like the Kennedy assassination. Where were you on 9-11? And everybody has their story. It, it, it has marked our generation. It was a win for the bad guys. We can't let that happen again. The 9-11 attacks bring immediate and profound change to commercial aviation, both in the US and around the world. The situation for airport security, airplane security, was a lot different prior to 9-11 than it is today. Just two months after the attacks, the US government creates the Transportation Security Administration, or TSA. The federal government took direct responsibility for aviation security. And the screeners are now federal employees. The training certainly has improved. The TSA brings in strict new rules on what travelers can carry on planes. Airports start screening passengers with full body scanning machines. There are also major changes to onboard security. The cockpit doors. I mean, it's not just the door, the whole bulkhead on the aircraft has been made darn near impregnable. It's, it's bulletproof, you can't get through the locks. But perhaps the most important change to security has come not from new rules or better technology, but from the permanently altered attitudes of airline passengers everywhere. Today, the assumption by passengers, if they feel threatened with hijacking, is not one of compliance. You saw somebody in the back of the plane get up and say, you know, start screaming things running to the front of the plane. You have a choice of sitting in your seat and minding your own business, or you have the option of standing up saying, uh-uh. I guarantee you, you're going to stand up. The paradigm has changed. Rotate. At 8.20 AM, American Airlines Flight 77 gets underway.
At 846, Flight 77 reaches cruising altitude, 35,000 feet. American 77, turn right 10 degrees, vectors for traffic. On the ground, air traffic controllers guide the 757. Turn right American 77. Thirty-four minutes into the flight, controllers notice something odd. What are you guys doing? Flight 77 is veering off course. American 77 center. American uh, 77 radio check. Two minutes later, their concern turns to alarm. 77 radio check. Flight 77 has vanished from their radar. Center calling American 77, American 77. Their concern grows with each second of silence. Center. Then, just after 9 a.m., a call comes in from American Airlines that's almost impossible for controllers to digest. Thousands of people are feared dead. Lower Manhattan is in chaos. The fate of the missing 757 is now much more worrying. What if it hasn't crashed somewhere in the Midwest? We need to find that plane. Supervisor. I've got a target tracking eastbound at a high rate of speed. At 9.32, more than half an hour after losing contact with the plane, controllers spot a mysterious radar return. If it is Flight 77, it means the plane has turned around back towards Washington. We got to warn DC. America's capital could be the next target. Go for 06. Do you have a commercial aircraft in sight? Controllers recruit another pilot to try to learn more. They radio the only other plane in the immediate airspace a C-130 cargo plane from nearby Andrews Air Force Base. Looks like an American Airlines 757. It's got to be our plane. Center calling American 77, American 77. But the 757 is ignoring all radio calls. And it's heading straight for Washington. Sunjet 2A2, proceed directly to runway, backtrack, and hold. Los Rodeos Airport on the Spanish island of Tenerife is busier than it's ever been. BA 7A3, hold short of the runway and stand by for taxi clearance. With so many planes parked in the taxiways, the controllers instruct departing flights to taxi along the airport's only runway to get into position for takeoff. One of the planes waiting to get to Las Palmas is Pan Am Flight 1736. The Pan Am crew is ready to get back in the air, but they can't taxi to the runway. A KLM 747 has stopped in front of them to refuel. Tenerife, KLM 4805, we finished refueling, requesting clearance for startup. He said, uh, follow KLM down a runway, backtrack, make an exit to get around back of KLM. So that's what we were doing. First Officer Bragg is unfamiliar with the airport. He checks a runway diagram to help find their turn. OK, that's this one right here. Goes ahead. It's going to put us on the taxiway. As they taxi, they listen to the tower controller tell the KLM crew ahead of them what to do after departure. You are clear to the Papa Beacon. Climb to and maintain flight level nine or zero. Right turn after takeoff. Roger, clear to the Papa Beacon. Flight level nine zero, right turn up. We are now at takeoff. Okay, uh, stand by for takeoff. I will call you. 
And we're still taxiing down the runway, Clipper 1736. Papa Alpha 1736, report runway clear. OK, we'll report when we're clear. Thank you. The Pan Am crew will be turning off the runway in just a few more yards. But now something's wrong. First Officer Bragg can see a plane through the fog. I think he's moving. Look at him. That idiot's coming. It's all KLM, too. Get off. Get off! <laughs> Captain Grubbs tries to steer clear of the oncoming KLM. But it's bearing down on them at nearly 200 miles an hour. He had lifted off the runway. I could see his rotating beacon underneath. Get off, get off, get off. Get off, get off, get off! And then I ducked and set a real quick pair. God, I hope he misses us. China Airlines Flight 120 is on final approach for landing. They're now less than a minute from the runway. T, 20, 10. It's a textbook landing. All that's left for the China Airlines pilots is to park the plane. Engine start levers. Engine start levers, cut off. With the engines off, they can finally relax. Hey, what is this? What's happening? Just when they thought they were safely parked. Cockpit, ground, number two engine fire. A radio call alerts them to an urgent danger. Their plane is on fire. Attention crew on station, attention crew on station. Dynasty 120, we are calling a fire truck, remain, stand by. Uh, we have wheel fire, please. Slap lever. The pilots know they need to get their passengers off the plane before flames reach the fuel tanks but they can't open the cabin doors yet. Engine fire warning switches, override. They must follow an evacuation checklist. Finally, the pilots are ready to open the doors. Evacuation required now, required. No pushing, no pushing. Please keep moving forward. But it will take time for all 157 passengers to make it to the exit. George Ishizaki is watching the unfolding disaster from inside the airport terminal. I just happened to have my camcorder with me. I thought, oh my god, what is happening? The plane has been burning for close to three minutes. It could explode at any moment. <coughs> Captain. All passengers are evacuated. You're the last one. Typically, the captain will stay until everybody's off, and he will verify that the airplane is empty. The pilots have put their passengers safety first. But now, it may be too late for them. We're going to have to climb up to the window. You first. Sir. All 737 cockpits are equipped with an emergency escape rope. It's designed to help pilots exit through the side window. But it's no easy maneuver. Fire on an airplane can quickly become lethal. Incredibly, on Flight 120, all 165 people on board have escaped unharmed. I've never heard of any evacuation where somebody wasn't hurt to get this many people off in such a dire circumstance in a very short period of time with no injuries is miraculous. In one of the busiest weeks of summer, Proteus Airlines Flight 706 heads to the coast of Brittany, Western France. Flight 706 left Lyon Airport a little more than an hour ago. They're on schedule to land at Lorient in approximately 20 minutes. 
The twin-engine Beechcraft 1900D can carry 19 passengers. Today, they're in for a treat, the rare chance to see a treasured piece of French maritime history, a luxury ocean liner formerly known as the SS France. They descend to 2,000 feet and begin circling the ship. Without any warning, a private Cessna hit the beach craft. Investigators believe they understand the unusual sequence of events that led to tragedy in the sky over Keeper Own Bay. Okay. I think we now know what happened. The beach craft is nearing the airport in Lorient. At the request of a passenger, the captain asks to deviate from the flight path. Zero 06, and one little special request to fly slightly west over Kiberon Bay, sir. They decide to take a look at the ocean liner, La France. Proteus Airlines Flight 706 diverts over the bay and descends to 3,700 feet. Once near the ship, they decide to descend to get a closer look. But to go below 3,700 feet, they cancel instrument flight rules and go visual. 706, L'Oreal confirmed. Now the Beechcraft is in uncontrolled airspace, below radar. With no guidance from air traffic control, it's up to the captain to visually scan for nearby planes. There's a Cessna. Then once at 2,000 feet, they decide to do a 360 degree turn around the ship. With the 360 almost complete, the pilots begin to prepare for landing at Lorient. At the same moment, the Cessna is approaching from the right. The Cessna does not have its transponder on, and it's communicating on a different radio frequency from the Beechcraft. The bank angle of the Beechcraft, combined with the fact that the pilot responsible for scanning the skies was sitting in the left seat, make the approaching Cessna impossible to see. They can see only sky out of the right-hand side of the plane. By terrible coincidence, the Cessna pilot can't see the Beechcraft either. At the last moment, the Beechcraft comes out of the blind spot. And it's too late. No! Ah! Oh my God! It's a cold winter's evening at Stapleton Airport in Denver, Colorado. Captain Stephen Silver and First Officer Ralph Harvey are just about ready for takeoff. Hey, everybody seated? Yep, everybody's in. No good outside? Walk around was all clear. Trans Colorado Flight 2286 is a short hop to Durango La Plata County Airport in Southern Colorado. Listen, when we get to Durango, I'd like to get in the air again as quickly as possible. Shouldn't be a problem. We won't need to refuel. It's the crew's fourth flight of the day, and they're running late. Bad weather has put them 40 minutes behind schedule. Trans Colorado 2286, you are cleared for takeoff. 2286, clear for takeoff, thank you. Captain Silver is in command. First Officer Harvey will operate the controls for this flight, leaving the captain free to handle radio calls. Takeoff power. 100. The captain keeps an eye on the airspeed as they accelerate for takeoff. V1, and rotate. The crew's day began in Denver. After two short hops to Riverton and Casper, Wyoming, they circled back to Denver. Now they're headed for Durango, a route that takes them over the southern Rocky Mountains. About 20 minutes from the airport, the captain and the first officer review the landing. So we're still doing the straight into runway 20, OK? Runway 20, sounds good. Control, we'll plan on a DME to runway 20. 
That's approved. Trans Colorado 2286 cleared for runway 20 approach at Durango Airport. Like many small airports in America, Durango does not have its own air traffic control. The controller is in Denver, more than 200 miles away. Speed set, one quarter flaps. One quarter flaps. The pilots work quickly to prepare for landing. Gear down. Gear down. Three green. Do you have the runway? Something's wrong. The pilots can't see the runway. Damn, we're, we're too low. No. Pull out. No, 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 no. Hold on. Of the 17 people on board, the crash has killed nine, including both pilots. It's a sunny morning at Barcelona Airport in Spain. After start checklist, anti-ice. Anti-ice off, rudder trim. Rudder trim is zero. The crew of German Wings Flight 9525 is preparing for departure. Flight attendants, please take your seats for takeoff. Captain Patrick Sondenheimer is a former Lufthansa first officer who recently transferred to German Wings. First Officer Andreas Lubitz, who has been with the airline for just over a year, will handle the flying. Cleared for takeoff, 07 right. German Wings 9525. Take off thrust. Just after 10 a.m., German Wings Flight 9525 gets airborne. They're heading northeast over the Gulf of Lyon towards the French Alps. They should be in Dusseldorf in just over two hours. 27 minutes into the flight, the plane reaches its cruising altitude of 38,000 feet. Marseille, German Wings 9525. Flight level 380. Air traffic control in Marseille tracks the plane as it crosses France. Four minutes later, the controller in Marseille notices something odd. German Wings Marseille, confirm what cruising altitude you're cleared for. Flight 9525 is descending without permission. German Wings, this is Marseille, come in, please. We've got a problem here. German Wings are unresponsive, descending rapidly. The plane is dropping steadily. In just minutes, it's lost 10,000 feet. The control center is now on emergency mode. Now approaching 25,000 feet. The Airbus is hurtling downwards at maximum operating speed, an astonishing 350 knots. German wing, come in. Lima, Echo, X-ray, relay from Marseille. I need you to try and contact German wings 9525. What is their situation? The plane has dropped below 7,000 feet. The towering mountains loom closer. It's been 10 minutes with no radio contact, an eternity for controllers. Oh, up. Too low. Terrain. We've lost contact. The plane is now too low to be detected by radar. Oh, up. Too low. Boeing 737 cruises high above the islands of Indonesia. The crew of Garuda Indonesia 421 is about halfway through a short domestic flight. We were at 28,000 feet on the way to Adisucipto Airport in Yogyakarta. Captain Abdul Rozak is a senior pilot with Indonesia's National Airline. 
How does the weather look in Yogyakarta? His first officer is Harry Gunawan. Should be fine, but there might be a bit of rain. Dan. I had flown several times with Harry Gunawan, so it was nothing new. We knew each other quite well. January is the rainy season, when the weather is unpredictable. Let's avoid that south. Say, heading 300. Control. Garuda 421, request heading 300 to avoid some weather up ahead. Garuda 421 confirmed, heading 300. Fly direct to Bravo Alpha NDB after clearing weather. Air traffic control authorizes a slight course correction to steer the plane around some looming clouds. But soon, more large storm clouds appear in their path. What do you think? I could see the green, yellow, and red on the radar, and I knew that the safest route would be towards the green. But moments later, the weather is suddenly much worse. Where did this come from? The captain spots a serious problem. <laughs> yes, sir, one and two are dropping. They're suddenly losing engine power. Captain Rozak struggles to keep the plane steady as the altitude starts to drop. With his plane falling fast and no other option in sight, Captain Rozak decides to do something few pilots have ever tried. OK, the river then. It's our best chance. Yes, sir. Tell me what to do. No gear, no flaps. Watch my speed. The Solo River is narrow and twisting. Ditching a 737 on it won't be easy. Uh, speed! 170, sir. That'll do. As they line up with the river, First Officer Gunawan notices another problem. There's another bridge. Altitude, 250. Bridge can't be more than 80 feet. We're good. It turns out I had to land the plane between two bridges. 150. Warn the cabin. Brace for landing. Brace for landing. Brace for landing. Everyone, brace for landing. Flight 421 hits the water at almost 200 miles an hour. Of the 60 passengers and crew on board, all but one make it out alive. Air Asia Flight 8501 cruises high above the Java Sea north of Indonesia. The pilot in command is 53-year-old Captain Irianto. He's highly experienced with more than 20,000 hours in the air. His first officer is French national Rémy Emmanuel Plaisel. He is 46 with about 2,000 flight hours, much of it on the Airbus. 22 minutes into the flight, the pilots notice bad weather ahead on their radar. The captain decides to increase altitude to go above the storm clouds in their path. I'm going to radio for a higher cruise, get around that weather. Good idea. But before the captain can contact air traffic control, he gets a fault warning from the flight computer. Ecam actions. The plane's sophisticated computers give the pilot step-by-step -step instructions on how to fix the issue. The pilots now notice that the plane is rolling sharply left. Level. OK, level. Something is going terribly wrong with flight 8501. The first officer is struggling. Level. But soon, the plane is rolling again. Level! I I'm trying! The pilots can't seem to regain control. <laughs> it's not responding. Pull down! <laughs> it's not correcting. The plane seems to have taken on a life of its own. It climbs higher and higher as the pilots fight to level off. Then, inexplicably, the plane starts to drop. I see it. Flight 8501 is plummeting from the sky, speeding toward the ocean below. It seems the pilots can do nothing to save their plane. 
Pull! It's not correcting. What's going on? Max power. Slowly. Forty-three minutes into what should have been a normal two-hour flight, Air Asia Flight 8501 disappears from radar. Pull! I'm trying. Pull! It's not correcting. Ah. Ah. Of the 162 passengers and crew, there are no survivors. Bagram Airfield in northeastern Afghanistan. It's a hive of activity. Bagram, ground, ISAF. 9-5, Alpha Quebec, ready to taxi. The crew of National Airlines Flight 102 is on the last leg of a grueling shift. The flight plan has taken it from Châteauroux, France, to Camp Bastion, Afghanistan, where the crew loaded up to 207,000 pounds of cargo. They were supposed to take it straight to Dubai, but were rerouted via Bagram. Finally, at 3.25 p.m., they're cleared for takeoff. 95 Alpha Quebec, runway three, full length. Runway three is verified. Prepare for departure. The first officer is at the controls for this final leg. They're scheduled to arrive in Dubai in two and a half hours. At that same moment, military journalist Stephen Hartoff is on the base's perimeter road, returning from a day's work taking photographs for a magazine. We decided we were going to go get something to eat. And I saw, off to the left of the truck, a white and purple 747. And I remember thinking, this is a beautiful airplane, because it looked brand new. V1, rotate. Gear up. Gear up. He pulled away from us and started to rotate. And in this case, there was something immediately not right the climb is unusually steep. What's going on with that aircraft? It was almost stuttering in the air. K keep on that. Get the nose down! I'm trying! The plane is suddenly uncontrollable. The nose won't drop. My airplane! In a matter of seconds, the crew is in emergency mode. If they can't get the nose down fast, the plane will stall. For a moment, the plane hangs in the air suspended. And then the aircraft seem to sort of careen in our direction. Now you're looking at a big 747 coming at you. Stop the car. And then it completely foundered and stalled. And uh, I remember thinking, he's lost all his engines. Don't sink. Don't sink. And in a very slow motion, it just went straight down and pancaked into the ground. The explosion was enormous. 